Welcome to Near Westside, Milwaukee's finest community. A great place for you and your family to learn and grow, to have stability, and truly to love the people. We strive to have the best place to live, to learn. Subscribe. Stanley, I'm the executive director of the Near West Side Partners, and I'm joined by a very special guest. Can you introduce yourself? I'm Lindsay Bloomer. I'm the president and CEO of WRTP Big Step. Now, for those of you who may not know, WRTP Big Step is a, actually a Near West Side asset right on Wisconsin Avenue, and they have, for years, have done tremendous work. Lindsay, can you tell us what is WRT Big, Big Step? And at the same time, I would love to know who who's Lindsay. <laughs> sure. Um, well, WRTP Big Step or the Wisconsin Regional Training Partnership is we are just a group of people who are working toward building really impactful connections between people and industry. And we're using innovative and equitable ways to do that and reinforce the systems and the tools that build America's middle class. I like what you said, uh, her innovation, uh, her equity. Uh, equity. Talk to me about that. You know, WRT big, big, WRTP Big Step has had a long history with, that I remember at least working in the Nova side. And I remember many years people talking about it. What role are you playing when it comes to innovation in the workforce and equity in the workforce? Absolutely. So we really have three pillars if we think about our work. And the first is partnerships with high road employers. So those that have a commitment to equity, to inclusion, um, pay a reasonable living wage, um, and also our employers and industry networks, unions um, that traditionally have had worker protections, benefits, middle class wages, right? Um, political representatives and policymakers and strategic players. So we're really building this, this portfolio of different players to bring them together around workforce development. The second pillar is technical and relevant skills training um, and coaching for in-demand careers. And the key there is in-demand careers. Um, we particularly work in construction and manufacturing, but also there's emerging sectors that we're always um, have an eye to. And then the final pillar is engaging and driving apprenticeship. Apprenticeship, uh, Wisconsin was the first state to have apprenticeship. Um, and we continue that tradition because it is one of the best known ways to increase diversity and inclusion in uh, different occupations and also create a real pathway to the middle class, to family sustaining wages. Um, so in terms of equity and in terms of innovation, we're using this three pillar approach to really look at very specific strategies of bringing together public workforce dollars, our employer partners, industry partners, networks, unions, and then the participants themselves for skilled training so that we have a very clear pathway um, in that what we say in our mission is impactful connections between people and industry. So uh, what I hear, and please do correct me, Lindsay, if, if I'm wrong on this, partnerships on that first pillar, <laughs> and you're partnering with a number of different people, uh, organizations, but it seems like organizations and groups who have a clear connection and a clear need for jobs, is that correct? Correct. And then, career, high demand career bucket. And then the third uh, being apprenticeship, which I'm really excited about because I think that is the way to go for many job opportunities. So uh, let's take this now to a real world example. For those of you who don't know, I'm at Daddy's Soul Food Restaurant. Daddy's Soul Food is a 27th in Wales and it's a business we actually brought to the Northwest side, amazing family owned and operated business. Uh, would daddy be a, daddies be a good example? They need cooks and chefs as they expand and grow. Would that be an example? Or are we talking about more of some of my anchor institutions like Molson Coors or Harley Davidson? What fits the model for WRTP Big Step in those three pillars you're talking about? That's a great question. Really, it could be 
any industry. So it could be something like daddy's or it could be like an anchor institution. And what's really cool about the WRTP big step model is we can take that model and put it into any particular industry. So it might come in the form of customized training. Uh, it might come in the form of combining an MC3, which is a multi-craft core curriculum in entry-level construction with a high school equivalency degree at the same time um, for somebody who might wanna move up in Harley-Davidson. It might come in the form of a facilities maintenance technician apprenticeship or pre-apprenticeship um, at Advocate Aurora. Um, so, and it could, come in the form of Triada, which is our nonprofit staffing agency, which actually we use some of our trained um, participants who uh, want and need employment opportunities right away. Uh, we subsidize that work with somebody like daddies who might need some immediate help. Um, and then there, the big thing is any of the, the fees that we collect go directly back into WRTP to help train additional participants. And of course, there's no conversion fee either. So that really, we're not making money off it. We want that person to be gainfully employed and have that pathway to family sustaining wages. So it could come in many different forms, which is what's so cool about the model. So then now let's take this conversation to, to timing. Uh, I gave the, we gave a real world example and you've been able to respond the great reshuffle, the great resignation. As you lead this organization, WRTP Big Step, what are we looking at as far as the impact of the pandemic, both from the workers' side and then from the employer or the employees and then the employer side? And what role is, would WRTP Big Step play in trying to navigate this new world that we're in? I hope that's not too heavy of a question. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. In fact, it's something we've been looking at and examining over the last 18 months in a very real way, uh, because if anything, we need to learn from this and we need to better understand how the impact will uh, have ripples throughout our workforce system for years to come. So it's a great timely question. In terms of employees or participants, uh, what we're seeing is perhaps people who are entering uh, some of our more traditional uh, occupations or industry sectors that we work with, like construction and manufacturing um, or healthcare, coming from occupations like hospitality, um, which were hardest hit from the pandemic um, and are looking for additional skills. Um, and it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to change occupations, but maybe having that in their back pocket. We're also looking, um, some of our participants are also saying that. Um, we know now as data is starting to merge that women and people of color were disproportionately impacted in terms of layoffs, um, businesses shutting down during the pandemic and really bolstering the systems. Our work is really bolstering the systems, the cultural competency work and the pathways for women and people of color in industry so that they are not disproportionately impacted in the future. Um, on the employer side, what we're seeing is, you know, uh, really a better definition of the skills necessary for positions. Um, and sometimes that's not as many skills as we are necessary, they thought were necessary for entry level positions. So, you know, perhaps somebody said, oh, they need these five different skills. When in reality for the entry level position, really it's getting somebody in there and doing on the job training so that they're trained specifically for warehouse positions at Molson Coors or, um, you know, uh, something in a specific machine for some of our industrial manufacturing. Um, and so really taking a hard look at what are the real requirements of the jobs and can we do customize on the job training, engage with a partner like WRTP Big Step um, so that we can build our own talent pipeline rather than, you know, hiring entry-level workers, seeing what sticks, right? Instead, investing in human beings, investing in workers so that they can take that, um, they can take that with them in years to come. Uh, and that's a big part of apprenticeship as well. Some of our employers have also been very interested in apprenticeship as a re uh, recruitment and retention tool, that when you can see your path forward, that you're not stuck in a dead end job. You're not stuck in an entry level job, right? You have a pathway forward and you can see it and it's laid out very clearly. Your chances of staying with an organization rise dramatically. So this is, this is really helpful um, as you paint this picture on the role that WRTP Big Step has. The next question that then I have for you, as we take a look at um, 
you know, getting back to some sense of normalcy, whatever that is for the job market. Uh, I think we're all concerned um, about what the future looks like for uh, employment in Wisconsin. You have, when we first met, you had some really staggering statistics, uh, at least I believe so, as it relates to employment in the future in our population. Could you, you know, if you're speaking to, if you could, if, I, if, if this was to go out to the human resources people all across uh, the state, um, what should they be concerned with in the next five to 10 years? What should the human resources employing folks who are going to employ the next generation? What, what's, what are the concerns when it comes to uh, this next generation or just the job market in general when it comes to being able to hire people um, locally? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, yeah, you know, the the future of the workforce is going to change dramatically. Uh, we know that for sure, uh, based on demographics. So 2026 is predicted to be the year with the least amount of high school graduates uh, in Wisconsin since the early 40s. Um, so birth rates are declining, basically, is what that means. Um, we also have uh, an increased uh, focus on diversity and equity and inclusion, right? That um, the the days of well i'm going to hire my 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 best friend's son or my you know my uncle's cousin or whatever that is that's just not the way life is going to work anymore right like it's going to be people who are you know may um not be what we originally thought the talent pipeline might look like. Um, it has to be more diverse. It has to have a, a variety of experience. Um, and that can only make the organization better. To, to see hiring, to see the talent pipeline as asset-based rather than deficit-based will become much more effective in the next two, three, 10 years. Um, I think we'll also see a widening of that talent pipeline of course, with generally less humans. Um, it also means we have to think about where our traditional talent pipelines were and how we can expand that. Um, that may include uh, perhaps justice involved, previously justice involved individuals. Um, it may, of course, do that um, on the job training for uh, youth, perhaps pr creating youth apprentice or youth pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, and it may include coming up with some uh, partnerships, and I'm going to put a plug in for WRTB Big Step, but with any intermediary provider um, that could provide customized training or provide some of, we, we work with employers to do career fairs, um, you know, for targeted uh, individuals with specific skill sets, right? So thinking broadly, um, also partnerships with the local workforce board. There's a ton of resources out there um, that sometimes uh, are not readily apparent when uh, when there were bigger pipelines, bigger talent pipelines. And then I think finally thinking about, um, you know, all the ways that we can be more culturally competent in our hiring. We can think broadly about, um, again, how we can provide an equitable hiring process. Um, and that, that includes leveraging some of those partnerships, right? Uh, you know, we have some inside knowledge. We're working with hundreds of thousands of participants every year. And we know some of the stumbling blocks. We know some of the barriers. Um, so even, you know, educating ourselves on data, research, information, and working with our partners to better understand how we can change the way we think about hiring and investing in our workforce. Um, I hear a lot sometimes of, well, this generation, our Gen Z or the next generation is, X, Y, Z, right? When in reality, you know, I think it's it's a response. We're going to see a response to 2008, which was our economic downturn. So we saw a lot of, um, you know, kids growing up in households where it was difficult. Things got really hard in 2008. Parents lost jobs, right? Um, and then, uh, then 10 years later, 10, 12 years later, impacted by a global pandemic, where again, priorities were shifted. People not only lost jobs this time, but perhaps uh, lost lives, right? Lost loved ones. And so that changes a generational thinking about their relationship to employment and their willingness uh, to work for an employer that cares about them, that invests in their training, that invests in their professional development, and that invests long-term in their, sustain their financial sustainability, 
because when an employer invests in the, the financial sustainability of that employee and that employee's family, that's how we build back a, matter, a better a middle class that is able to purchase community services, that interacts with the community in a way that uh, sustains uh, family-owned businesses, right? And so it ultimately um, will continue to provide employment um, and employees for decades and perhaps into ne the next generation. Uh, Lindsay, I'm so glad you bring that up. Uh, as we wrap this up, because my last question was, just about that. And, you know, you pretty much covered it, but I there's, I was gonna say there's a dynamic there. The, the one side, I woke up this morning, I'm flipping through my phone as many of us do. The headline was 2,750 one percenters are, have more wealth than like the bottom 75 million in this country. Then on the other hand is people are leaving the workforce and somehow it's just, the it's not working for them. Now, we don't even have to get it, like, I don't want to be mindful of politics, but put politics aside. Something is happening where people who are either in the workforce or entering the workforce, whether they've only been in it for a couple of years, for many of our now uh, Gen Zs, we got the millennials, I'm a Gen Xer, we got the millennials, and now we got the Gen Zs, where they're entering the workforce. Like, Listen, if you're not going to invest in me, or if your mission isn't something that's greater, I'm not interested. Um, I know you pretty much kind of recapped it. Any thoughts on how employers, outside of what you mentioned about the investing, education, uh, you know, mission, how can employers adapt to this world where, listen, a lot of people feel overwhelmed and overworked. Any thoughts about that? How do you connect with them? How do you, how do employers build the trust, gain people to come back into the workforce? A lot of people are kind of giving up. They're, you know, making $10 an hour, I think 52 million Americans make $10 an hour. That's not, you know, and most of that is ate up by rents and, and other transportation costs. What do we need to do differently? What do we need to redo as a society to rethink, re rethink differently? Or rethink, I should say, um, the employer-employee relationship outside of what you've already mentioned? Mm -hmm. I think the greatest starting point is listening. And listening perhaps to sources you may not have listened to before. Uh, and that could mean spending a day or a couple hours shadowing a, you know, a training program uh, or spending some time, you know, there's a workforce development component to Goodwill Industries. We have a workforce component and an and a training program at WRTV Big Step. Um, our workforce board here in Milwaukee, Employ Milwaukee, has transitional jobs programs. Um, and you know, we work together at, as organizations, but for employers to spend some time, and maybe it's spending time with our board members or spending time actually on the floor of some of the training programs or out with some of our, um, our youth build participants working on houses um, here in the near west side, you know what? and just listening about what are their concerns? What are they looking forward to? What do they have hesitations about? And I think the key thing to keep in mind here is, especially with, you know, when we widen that talent pipeline, it means we're gonna, we're gonna interact with each other um, in different ways. We come from different places. We come from different perspectives, from different experiences. None of those are right or wrong. We are the experts in our own lived experiences. And when we can look at that as a huge asset to our companies and as employers, we will be better for it because we're listening for what people bring to that. And I think all of us in some way want to bring something. We want to bring our expertise. We want to bring our lived experiences. And knowing that there is no cure for being human um, particularly, it, you know, as we focus more on trauma-informed care, when we think about our lived experiences and we've all had different types of lived experiences, we're all going to make mistakes. You know, there's going to be that day that the flat tire happens and you're going to be late to work and it's not going to be a great day. That doesn't make you a bad employee or a bad worker. It doesn't mean you don't care about the, you know, the, the workplace or your coworkers. And I think giving ourselves 
and our talent pipeline, our, our future workers right after we've listened, giving them that moment of grace to say, there is no cure for being human. We are all human and we bring to this workplace, this workforce, really an incredible tapestry of diversity and appreciating that rather and, and pulling out those old systems or those old ways of thinking that are punitive um, so that we can actually work toward building a workforce that is sustainable, that is well-paid, that is well-cared for, that has benefits and that can support families in a very real way. Lindsay, I am so glad you are in this spot. I am. I think that you're going to be able to really help um, our community do better. Um, I was lucky enough, privileged enough to have a former boss who was my mentor. And I sometimes I would show up late and I have all this human stuff going on, taking care of family members and stuff. And they gave me the grace to grow. Don't get me wrong, I'm still learning. But then I return that with the people who now I directly report to me. As long as you're making what we need to get done, you're bidding those goals, you know, it's not in the grand scheme of things. There's so many other things that we have to do in society. Uh, and so I just really appreciate a person who understands that because I think ultimately there's been a whole group of people historically disenfranchised because, well, you don't fit this. You don't fit our culture. You don't fit what we want. At the same time, they're very talented and they may be a little rough around the edges, but if you can work with these people and build them up and invest in them, they can really bring home uh, 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 what the, uh, the mission of the corporation or the mission of the company, and they can add value. So I really do value that. I really appreciate a person who understands that. This is not the last conversation, uh, Lindsay. Um, I need you, if you can, give a commercial real quick to WRTV Big Step. Where do people go to find information? Is there a newsletter? Is there a website? Is there a Facebook, YouTube channel? Where do people go to find information about WRTP Big Step? WRTP Big Step is everywhere. You can find us all across uh, Milwaukee, Racine, and Madison, actually, and actually across the whole state. But if you want to get in contact with, with us directly, wrtp.org is our website. On there, you will find all of our socials, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, many ways to contact us. Um, you can even stop by our offices here at 3841 West Wisconsin Avenue, um, where we also have our training center. We're happy to give tours. We're happy to um, you know, talk to you about all of our services. Um, and of course, uh, we also uh, are at all the events, we try and hit all the events. You can find our outreach coordinators everywhere. And um, we always love hearing um, from our friends and our partners and, you know, those who we haven't, who are friends, we just haven't met yet, so. Lindsay, I appreciate that. I think that wraps it up. Uh, we're gonna conclude this interview and just let the audience know, uh, we, Neverside Partners, we, a part of the work we do and a part of our mission and strategic value strategic plan is to make sure we're connecting our resources in this community to the close to 40,000 people who live, work, or stay in this in this community. So we're excited to be able to work with Lindsay and her team, and uh, we'll have all the information she said linked at the bottom of in the description of this video. Uh, and uh, Lindsay, once again, thank you for this time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Welcome to Midwestside. Milwaukee's finest community, a great place for you and your family to learn and grow, to have stability, and truly to see the love of people. We strive to have the best place to live, to learn, to love. Subscribe.